Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Bill Dodd in for Troy Mulling this week. Thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. We've got a lot to get into this week, so let's jump right in. With fluctuating temperatures, many Nebraska producers have had no choice but to hold off on planting. However, being faced with downtime doesn't mean you have to stay still while waiting for temperatures to climb to suitable planting weather. Now is the perfect time to test your fields for soybean cyst nematode. I recently spoke with extension educator Kyle Broderick to get the dirt on this nuisance. As many producers are waiting for temperatures to rise to optimal levels for planting, now is a great opportunity to check your fields for soybean cyst nematode. Simple management decisions now, such as field sampling, could mean a reduction in potential losses down the road. Soybean cyst nematode continues to be one of the most yield-limiting pathogens of soybeans, not only in Nebraska, but across the United States. Um, and one of the problems with this nematode is management is somewhat difficult. While we do have, we do have a few tools to manage this, um, this nematode, rotation, rotation, rotation. Rotation to a non-host is one of the most effective means to, um, to help manage this nematode. And so rotating um, away from soybeans, whether that is corn, alfalfa, um, or wheat, and um, the nematode is unable to, to reproduce on many of the, our other commodity crops here in Nebraska. In addition to rotating away from, away from a non-host crop for SCN, we also do want to be managing some of our winter annual weeds, such as field pennycress or henbit. Now, in, when looking at research, looking at um, SCN populations in the field, showed very low reproduction on, um, on either of these two winter annual weeds. However, in a greenhouse setting, we were able to see reproduction occur. So managing those winter annual weeds continues to be an important means of, of main, um, continues to be an important means of, re, of reducing your soybean cyst nematode populations. While crop rotation will be your most efficient and cost-effective option for management, the importance of rotating your soybean resistance can't be overstated. Unfortunately, um, about 95% of the soybean cyst nematode resistant beans in Nebraska have the same source of resistance, this PI88788. And luckily, um, this year we do have a new, new introduction. Um, oh, there are two lines um, from Syngenta. Uh, one is an NK line and one is a golden harvest line but those contain the resistance source 89772. And it's important to use this separate resistance source because a survey done in the mid-20-teens looking, um, looking at soybean cyst nematode reproduction on 88788 resistance revealed that almost 50% of soybean cyst nematode populations in Nebraska could easily reproduce on that, same, on that source of resistance. And so making sure that we are rotating to a different source of resistance will help delay um, the nematode populations from overcoming these resistant sources. Kyle did point out to me that some management recommendations at this point will be very difficult to implement as producers have already purchased their seed. However, he did emphasize that testing the cyst population in your fields continues to be one of the most important things a producer can do to manage this pathogen. Now, luckily, um, this testing is completely free for soybean growers in the state of Nebraska. This is a part of your soybean checkoff dollars, and for the past 12 years, the Nebraska Soybean Board has funded a soybean cyst nematode survey program where growers can submit, um, can submit soil to the diagnostic clinic, and we will process that for free. We do recommend that you test the field entryways um, or low-lying low areas in the field or anywhere along a waterway or previously flooded area. That's where we tend to see these nematode populations show up, the, um, show up first, and then our numbers tend to be higher in those areas as well. So remember, anything that moves soil can move the nematode. 
So whether that is, whether that is water, whether that is, is your equipment, or whether that is just us walking from field to field, that can, that can help um, transport the nematode. And so trying to target those areas where soil is deposited and soil is moved continues to be one of the great, um, continues to be a good spot to first test for soybean cyst nematode. While it may be hard to implement some recommendations at this point in time, sampling fields now for soybean cyst nematode can save you headaches down the road. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. If you have any questions regarding soybean cyst nematode or are in need of any sampling bags, you're encouraged to reach out to your local extension office, and we've also included a few helpful links on the Market Journal website. Moving on now, and it's time for our weekly market analysis. Joining us this week is Trados commodity trader Doug Simon. This week, Doug and I discussed a multitude of topics ranging from basis to conditions in South America, but we began by discussing the current planting progress here in the U.S. And so it, it's on average, like you said, they're a little faster on the in the eastern Corn Belt over in Illinois, and a little slower out here where we've had some snow. I actually drove down to Memphis on the weekend, and there's some stuff going on down there, but they've had a lot of rain down that way, so they're they're a touch slow probably down that way, but. Uh, yeah, we're early in the year, you know, weather next week's supposed to warm up. I think there's a lot of farmers chomping at the bit. There's a little bit of corn and beans in around here. Uh, not a lot, but uh, more so in the Eastern Corn Belt. But yeah, it's, uh, I don't think yesterday people were asking about why the market was excited. They're not, I don't think they're excited about the, you know, corn and soybean planting pace, maybe a little bit about the wheat side of it. Uh, but that, uh, you yeah, know, it's right on pace there. And Doug, I know Troy wouldn't let you get out of here without talking a little bit about basis. So what can you tell us? Last year, basis levels were pretty warm, and probably the, the best thing going on right now is ADM Columbus, which is the largest ethanol you know, plant in our state, and the other one is uh, Blair. I mean, the ADM Columbus has come back online, and so they're buying corn, and their basis levels have improved from you know, 1,800 to 1,200 you know, two weeks ago, and then they came into actually 12 over on basis. So they, they swung about 24 cents here in the last week, which is good to see. It's good for the local market. When you look at ethanol margins, uh, look at Iowa State's ethanol calculator, I mean, average, you know, over cost is about 24 cents. And the year prior to the pandemic, it was about nine cents positive. So that the ethanol margins have improved in here. And that's probably allowed ethanol, that ethanol plant of Columbus to restart. And uh, there's also some ethanol shipments that had occurred, you know, three weeks ago that uh, ethanol going to China, which is good. So We've got a very hot export market, so we've got rail loaders here in the state competing with the ethanol plants, and that's given us a very firm basis. And the nice thing too, also, the futures market's inverted by 16 cents. The, the May board is 16 cents over the July board, so when you look at that deferred delivery, the cash bids had actually been lower. They're, they're trying to encourage people to deliver corn sooner than later, and, and now at least we're seeing some maybe a touch of carry in some of the markets where I think everybody's concerned about getting enough corn delivered, not only just April, May, while people are planning, but also into that June, July. People don't want to let any corn get away um, for that four month period. So it's, that's encouraging from a, from a farmer's perspective. And you mentioned grain prices continue to do well. A lot of folks are wondering just how much higher can these markets go? Any thought on that? It's, Really, when you look at it, last time I was on here, I talked about weather in South America. The second crop that they raise in Brazil, in Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sol, and those areas in that kind of main uh, second crop, the Safrina crop, it's been dry. And now we're in their kind of June, July timeframe. So it's really critical that they get moisture. And they go from a rainy season into a dry season. So the corn crop got started late because it was a little wet early. Now it's it's dry and it's concerning because they've got projected about 109 million metric ton crop. And if you lose 10% of that crop, that's you know 10 million metric tons or equivalent of about 400 million bushels. And our exports from the US then are gonna pick up and be able to compensate for that lost export capacity that they had, which is why we're pushing this market higher. It's also gonna give us more export opportunity out late into the summer but it's also going to draw, draw down our old crop stocks, which are projected to be somewhere 1.3 billion. You know, maybe you're down closer to a billion. That's the kind of math that people are running through their heads the last several days. 
So how much higher can it go? I mean, that's that, that's a good question, but right now, a little bit relaxed overnight, you know, from where it, it started out this morning, prices are off a little bit, but there's gonna be ups and downs, but it, it, it's still gonna be a rush between these importers, um, the, the trains that they're trying to fill and, and these ethanol plants, because the margins are all good. So it's, it's positive for, for the farmer right now. Yeah, before we let you go today, Doug, do you have any marketing or risk management advice you'd like to share with our viewers today? As a risk manager, we're always looking ahead in terms of trying to protect our corn and soybean crops. And farmers look at those break evens right now. If you've got 530 D's corn and you've got beans that breached, you know, the $13 level overnight, those are highly profitable. So we're asking ourselves if we look at selling incrementally over a season, you know, a seasonal time frame, and we're in the April already, you know, we want to make some sales in February and March and April on the on the corn and the beans, we're kind of getting into a point here where we want to be doing some things, but we've been using options this year more just to have some flexibility the upside because of these tight balance sheets. And it'd be different if we were going to resolve our tight carryouts here soon, but we want to have that flexibility. So if we're hedging, we're buying some out of money calls to go with that. And if we're, you know, on the soybean side of it, again, hedging, buying some calls or using some puts. And if you go all the way out to November or December, those puts, there's a lot of time value in them. So there's a lot of premium that you're paying. We're using short dated options to put a floor underneath it, uh, allow us to trade into a higher market. You know, stuff that we did puts for before the, that report on or, uh, March 30th, the markets rallied 80 cents. So you give up a dime and a put and pick up 80 cents. That's a good trade off in my opinion. In a market that could be, it's gonna be very dyna dynamic this summer. You don't know where it's gonna go. So trying to sit here and predict what it's gonna do you can't do that today. You have to look, think about, okay, how am I gonna manage risk? I know basis is gonna be firmer into the summer for both corn and beans and new crop levels. So I don't wanna do any cash sales. Uh, I'll use futures, use the, the futures options market, uh, just because I think those basis levels that harvest delivery are gonna be firm again. And I think during next year, the marketing year, there's a lot of analogs to 2010, 11, and 12, if you go back and you look at the history right now. And so those basis levels in those years were very, very strong and gave us great opportunities to improve the, the futures prices that we were selling through there. So it was very, very dynamic. And the, I'm old enough now, I've kind of been around in those, some of those other markets. So I remember exact, not exactly what happened in 2010, 11, 12, but uh, we've got a lot of, uh, you know, kind of scars from those years. I know what, uh, know what happened and can anticipate what's gonna maybe show up here in the next, uh, next couple of years. Next week, we'll be joined by Elliot Dennis for a look at the livestock markets. If you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, please email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll be sure to pass that question along. And previously on this program, we've discussed how Nebraskans involved in agriculture have the opportunity to broaden their knowledge and experience through the Nebraska LEAD program. After a one-year hiatus due to the pandemic, the program resumes this year better than ever and is currently looking for applicants to be part of LEAD Class 40. Terry Haney is the director of the LEAD program and told us what he looks for in a new applicant. Well, we're looking for that person that wants to be the advocate for the industry. Uh, they want to sharpen their leadership skills. They want to figure out how to get involved. What's that first step? Someone that's open-minded, and of course, they've got to be involved in agriculture as a producer or as an agribusiness person. Chances are, Troy, they know someone in their community that's been through this program. They just need to take that first step, get in touch with us, request the application materials. They're due June 15th, and uh, we'll answer any questions they have and help them along the way explain the whole process to them. The application deadline is June 15th. You can visit lead.unl.edu or call Terry at 402-472-6810. For more information, everything is right here on your screen, and we've also posted it under this story on the Market Journal website. For cattle producers looking for ample amounts of forage, small grains and cover crops may be the best option. Market Journal's Maddie McIntosh spoke with Nebraska Extension educator Todd Whitney to learn more about these grazing opportunities. For producers looking for grazing opportunities, small grains and cover crops are a great option. Whether looking to graze out or continuing grazing, watching the height of the plants and the weather will tell you how long you'll be able to leave the cows in the field. We usually say wait until the plants are about 6 to 12 inches tall and then uh, graze it down to where it's uh, not less than 4 inches so then you keep moving them so it gives a chance for regrowth and continuing to graze. A lot of the small grains uh, are cool season grasses. And so as soon as we start getting hot, 
is when they start backing off in their production. But we usually say if you are uh, willing to rotational graze and not graze it hard, it can last clear till the mid part of June and probably still have pretty good production off of these, these plants. It's important to not overgraze your fields. Todd says there are a few different ways to go about this. Have an area where you're keeping it ungrazed and kind of see how the height of those plants are and, and the development of those. Um, you can have a system where you are um, rotational grazing, where you have paddocks, where it may be used an electric fence to only allow them to be in one part of the field at a time and keep moving that electric fence and then uh, allow them to come back around and come on grazing again. Um, they'll generally like to go to the lusher uh, grasses. So uh, if you have a system where you just keep letting them have a little bit more, that'll help uh, regrowth happen in some of the other areas. Um, also, you can adjust where you have your water located and they may want to come up and, and use that. And so if you can rotate where you have that located, that can also encourage them to graze into some of the areas that maybe they haven't been grazing in. And you're just trying to monitor the cattle and, and try to get a uniformity to what they're doing. Producers wanting to graze wheat and rye for dual purpose should make sure they don't wait too long past the joining stage to start. And so if we continue to graze while we have jointing happening, they could be actually eating off some of those immature heads. And so there are secondary tillers that are two weeks behind the primary, but if they're wanting to go to grain, we usually say pull them off before we get into the joining stage or what we call the hollow stem. If they're wanting to keep it as a grazing um, field, then the idea is to try to uh, not graze it all the way down, to leave at least four to, to six, eight inches, and then allow that regrowth to happen, and then come back again and try to maintain that six to 12 inches. Lastly, Todd says anything producers can do to extend the grazing in pastures will help their other pastures grow and gain tonnage before cattle are introduced. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Maddie McIntosh. Thanks, Maddie. If you'd like to learn more about grazing small grains or need any assistance determining when the time is right, you can visit cropwatch.unl.edu or reach out to your local extension office. Next up, Holdridge, Nebraska farmer Blake Johnson and his son Grady had a banner year in 2020. Not only did they break a world record for harvesting nearly 58,000 bushels of corn, the most ever harvested in an eight-hour period, but they were also named national champions in the no-till irrigated category of the National Corn Growers Association Corn Yield Contest. With a yield of just over 322 bushels per acre, Johnson has a common sense integrated approach to raising corn. You can read all about the details behind Johnson's corn growing strategies in the April issue of Nebraska Farmer. And it's time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. And Al, we've had everything but the kitchen sink thrown at us so far this month as far as winter goes. Are we going to see any sort of warming trend anytime in the near future? Yes, Bill, we had quite the week. A lot of cold air coming in earlier in the week held in place for the majority of the week. And we started to see a gradual warm up as we got toward the end of the week. We had a couple systems recently that moved through the state. Nothing but a little bit of light precipitation. We got one more system that will work through over the next 24, 36 hours, and then it looks like we're going to get into a very substantial warming trend, at least for several days before we deal with another upper air trough moving into the western United States with the potential to fire off some convection across the central and southern plains. So as we look at the upper air model, first thing I'll draw your attention to is that we do have a little piece of energy that was moved through yesterday, basically off to our north now basically trying to get the ridge built in, so a little bit warmer temperatures, but we're gonna have another piece of energy that's gonna slide through over the next 24 hours to keep us pretty much stable. But we have low pressure at the surface to the northwest of us, most of the heavy precipitation to the southeast of us. But as we get into tomorrow, we're gonna to see this trough deepen in the western United States. And it's gonna shoot some energy out over top of the ridge, and that will lead to some potential precipitation across the northern plains as we have low pressure at the surface developing northeastern Wyoming. That'll generate most of the moisture to the north of us, might touch northeastern Nebraska. But then as we get into Monday, Really warm air starts to develop as we get a southwest flow aloft and start to pump up moisture from the Gulf. We're going to be well spread into the 70s and potentially even the 80s as we get into Monday and Tuesday. Precipitation starts to break out into the central Rockies. 
The trough does move from the GFS standpoint in deep red right through Texas. This is a little bit deeper than it has been the last couple of days. I expect it to not be nearly as deep. Bottom line is a low pressure will start to try to develop over the uh, Texas Panhandle, and that will bring that Gulf moisture up and fire off some thunderstorms. Now this has been shifted down a little bit farther to the south, maybe a little bit farther north, but basically precipitation in stores. That trough begins to move on Wednesday toward the east of Texas. That'll bring some wraparound moisture also into the central plains. So we do have some decent shot of moisture, particularly across the eastern half of the state. If this system's a little bit farther to north, and we'll see more widespread precipitation across western Nebraska. By the time we get to Thursday, that trough moves over to the Ohio River Valley. We start to get some slight ridging. Low pressure tries to develop at the surface over the north central portions of Nebraska, but there's just no moisture as most of it is funneling up into the eastern Corn Belt. Notice the precipitation returns in the Pacific Northwest. That's our next system that starts to dive down into the central Rockies as we go into the end of the month into early portions of May. We start to see low pressure developing over southeastern Wyoming. That does bring some moisture convergence over the northern Rockies. And as we go through the weekend, this system is expected to develop some pretty significant weather across the central and southern plains. How uniform it is remains to be seen, but be aware another opportunity for precipitation goes as we get into next weekend. And as we look farther out, we do see that that does take into consideration that low pressure system moving into our region with basically normal temperatures and in terms of precipitation. Normal precipitation with the heaviest to the southeast. This might be shifted up back toward the northwest if that system comes out in one singular piece and a little bit farther to the north. So Bill, overall, it looks like some warm pattern and some planting weather ahead. Thanks, Al. Finally today, UNL's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources is launching the Center for Ag Profitability. Once complete, the center will facilitate faculty research, train students, and conduct outreach related to agricultural profitability. Mike Bame, Harlan Vice Chancellor for Nebraska's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources, joined Market Journal's Troy Moling to talk about this new initiative and some exciting things happening within IANR. So this is a new center that's housed in the Department of Ag Economics. It's been in the works for a while. So I think most uh, folks get that you can push uh, yields so far and uh, still not be profitable. So in the, in the row crop agriculture space, this is about dialing in practices and approaches that uh, maximize profitability while also making sure that the, the, the regenerative practices on individual farms lead to uh, land and soil and water that allows producers to produce for the next six generations. So this is a neat center. It's uh, supported by bankers and lenders, but also producers. Again, as the name implies, Troy, just really dialed in looking at net net profitability for our, our producers, both livestock producers as well as uh, our farmers. Yeah. And you mentioned Greg Eibach just a yeah. moment ago. He is back in Nebraska full time. We had him on the show not too long ago. Yep. It was great speaking with him. He's really excited about his new opportunity with yep. INR, and I know that you're thrilled to have him on board as well. Yeah, Greg was, of course, the director of the Nebraska Department of Agriculture when I arrived some four seasons, five seasons now ago, and uh, Greg was great and generous at helping me uh, make the transition from Ohio agriculture to Nebraska agriculture. Last uh, two years, he's he spent in uh, President Trump's administration working in the USDA. So the chance to uh, bring Greg in and uh, tap his Rolodex that he developed, but also his passion and his understanding for Nebraska agriculture. Um, really important. He was responsible for the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service while he was at the USDA. And so as we think about uh, different uh, systems, ag security, biotechnology policy, um, making sure that uh, our plants, our crops, and our livestock are secure from invasive pests and diseases is really a big deal. So Greg, Greg's just an all-around uh, great person. He and Teresa, of course, are producers, so they bring that, that, uh, that piece to the table as well. Definitely so, and I know that you love to brag on the folks within INR, and I know that we've got some awards, we've got some yeah. Uh, grants that folks within INR yeah. have received. Talk a little bit about that. Oh yeah, I love to brag on our amazing faculty, staff, and students. So uh, this uh, last week we found that uh, we were re-pegged for a $3.4 million operating grant for the High Plains Regional Climate Center. Since 1987, Nebraska has been home for one of only six regional climate centers in the whole country. And uh, we take care of a six-state region, give or take, and 
think about how we bring all of this climate data, put it in usable forms and get it in the hands of producers and processors. So that was a big deal. We had a, a professor in biosystems engineering land a grant that I would call looking at uh, variable rate technology on pivots 2.0. So we've been using data to guide pivots. Uh, of course, if you go out to Raising Nebraska, you can, you can be a variable rate pivot operator, and we look at soil types. Is it sandy? Is it clay? And we look at topography. But uh, this is also incorporating things like uh, Fitbits on corn or ground-based sensors to really have a two-way interaction, not just from satellites and topography, but also understanding what the plants are doing in the field, all designed to, to do more with less as you think about that. So those are just a couple of examples uh, here in the last seven to 10 days. And certainly since, since we visited, there's countless numbers of stories. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, and just with everything you've talked about, there's just so much that we're pulling from all different sectors of ag, all different parts of the yeah. state. But it's so interesting how this just all kind of fits into the pie of what IANR is accomplishing and able to do. Yeah, when you have a big umbrella, I guess, or a big tent, you can fit a lot of parts and pieces. But again, at the end of the day, it's thinking about how do we in Nebraska, third largest ag economy, produce food, fuel, feed, and fiber for this growing world. How do we do it in a way that takes care of our water, our land for those next six generations? And, and how do we take care of the people, the families, the communities that produce that food, fuel, feed, and fiber? And uh, that comes down to profitability. So when you, when you have that kind of a mission, you can certainly think about a lot of uh, ways to make a connection. And that's exactly what we do every day in the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources. Thanks to Dr. Bame for taking the time to speak with us. You can check out the extended interview on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. And don't forget, you can get the latest updates on the fight against coronavirus at covid19.unl.edu. We'll hope to see you right back here again next week. I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. <laughs>